afternoon, everyone. Uh, today's scripture is in James chapter 4, the book of James, just after the book of Hebrews. Hebrews is pretty big. James is really small. I'll give you a second to find it. Book of James chapter 4. Going from verse 14 to 17. James chapter 4, verse 14 to 17. Uh, I'll read the first verse, 14, and you guys read 15, and I'll read 16, and we'll all read 17 together. All right. The Bible says in James chapter 4, verse 14, Whereas you know not what shall be on the morrow, for what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time, and then vanisheth away. For us to say, if the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. But now you rejoice in your boastings. All such rejoicing is evil. Therefore, to him that knoweth to do good, and doeth it not, to him it is sin. Thank you, Lord. Uh, let's all pray. Thank you, Lord, for the service today. And please bless us. Today we need you, Lord. We're going out and we're going to witness to the lost in this country locally. Please put your spirit upon us and please uh, bless the preaching today. Help it to teach us and to encourage us and to embolden us. And thank you for your perfect word. And thank you for this church. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you, Brother Oliver. Appreciate your ministry there. Um, as we have the Christian series, I like to preach on the topic called The Christian and the Will of God. The Christian and the Will of God. And uh, as we had the series, you know, uh, the main theme of being a Christian is to be more like Jesus Christ. And uh, he is our example, and uh, he is our shepherd, and uh, he is our God. So uh, as we think about all the topics we shared uh, for the last maybe good uh, eight weeks or so, uh, those things were shared and preached because of Jesus Christ. And so uh, I hope our focus is always on Jesus as we live this Christian life. And as we think about the will of God today, I think all of us, in hindsight, we know that we need to make sure that it's not our will, but God's will that is leading us. And so uh, I want to talk about that today. I think there's some uh, different type of, uh, you know, misunderstanding about the will of God. And I like to kind of break it down to different categories so that it's more understandable. And some people could be very confused about the will of God because of feelings or maybe because of circumstances and uh, maybe because, you know, uh, uh, people have influenced them in a different way. Uh, so I have to kind of clear all that up today, if possible, and by God's word, of course. And I hope this message will be a great help to all of us. Now, as we live this life, okay, it's very clear that we make many decisions. Okay? How many of you made a decision this morning? Okay? You, had a, you made a decision to wake up, amen, all right? And uh, you made a decision to get dressed, all right, and then do your hair and then come to church. You made a decision uh, to eat breakfast and, uh, you know, drink a coffee. And, uh, you know, uh, you made a decision to you know, uh, take a different route maybe to come to church. Maybe uh, you took the train or maybe you took the car. And, uh, you know, there's some different decisions that we make every single day. As human beings, it is natural to do that. And uh, we make personal decisions, career decisions, uh, family decisions, and spiritual decisions. And we're somewhat bombarded with making many choices and decisions every single day. Now, in an online research, I'm not sure how accurate they are, but it is said that an adult makes about 35,000 decisions or choices a day. 35,000, okay? It could be very minor, you know, just things that we just talked about, waking up, you know, eating, uh, ch and choosing what kind of breakfast you want to eat. You know, there's some little tiny decisions, even thought process. You know, you're making decisions on those things. And so uh, 35,000 a day for an adult. And a child will make about 3,000 decisions. Okay, <laughs> very small. Now, why is that? Well, because the parents are making them for, uh, we're making the decisions for them, right? And we're making the choices for them. And uh, even in marriage, and uh, as a husband, I need to make some more decisions for 
not only my children and for, also for my wife, for our marriage as well. And so, uh, you know, a lot of people might need to make decisions not only for themselves, but for other people. And uh, think about pastoring, you know, and uh, you give counseling and uh, you kind of direct some people in a different way. And, of course, through the Bible. And that's another decision making that you're helping out with another. And so you might have more if you're maybe in ministry, too. So uh, as we think about all this, it is very clear that we make choices and decisions. And the reason is, is because God has given us free will and free choice. And uh, he has given us liberty to have free will so that we can make choices in our lives. God did not make us to be like robots where we just do one thing all day. Okay? And Brother Agu and I were talking about his job and, uh, yesterday, and he just does one thing throughout the whole day. But you're making decisions and choices, right, still, and for eight hours or so. And I asked him, is it, is it fun? And, well, it's kind of boring, okay? And, uh, but, you know, he's at a, uh, you know, uh, uh, like tech industry type of, uh, 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 like a machinery type of factory. But anyways, you know, we're not like robots where we're just doing one thing all the time and, uh, and just know how to do one thing. Now, we're not made like that. We have feelings, we have responses, we have motives, we have purpose, okay? And I think that's one of the reasons why we, we are made in the image of God. And uh, now, does God have free will? He does, okay? And uh, let's go to Psalm 115, verse 3. Psalm 115, verse 3. Psalm 115, verse 3. Psalms in the Old Testament, right, almost right in the middle of the Bible, Psalm 115, verse 3, it says here in verse 3, but our God is in the heavens, he had done, what's the next word? Whatsoever, right? Whatsoever he had what? Pleased. Okay, so God has feelings and he takes pleasure in some things. And he, it, says, it says here that he has done whatsoever yeah, uh, that, that will be pleasing to him. And then now go to Psalm 135. Okay, that was Psalm 115. Now go to Psalm 135. 135. Okay. Psalm 135, look at verse 6. Okay. Verse 6. Whatsoever, once again, whatsoever the Lord pleased, that did he in heaven and in earth, in the seas, and all deep places. Okay, very clear. God does whatever he pleases, whatsoever the Lord pleased. Go to your Bible to Ecclesiastes now, chapter 3. Ecclesiastes chapter 3. Look at verse 14. Sorry if I'm going a little fast here. But Ecclesiastes 3, look at verse 14. Okay. And if you have trouble finding uh, a scripture, please... Uh, uh, you know, uh, ask one of us, and we could help you as well. But go to uh, Ecclesiastes 3.14. If you see someone that needs help, please do go next to him and help him out. But 3.14, he says, I know that whatsoever God do it, it shall be forever. Nothing can be put to it, nor anything taken from it. God doeth it that men should fear before him. Okay, so once again, Whatsoever God doeth. Go to your Bible to Isaiah chapter 40. Isaiah chapter 40. Isaiah chapter 40. Look at verse 13. Okay. <clears throat> it says here, Who had directed the spirit of the Lord, or his being counselor had taught him? With whom took he counsel? And who instructed him and taught him in the path of judgment and taught him? knowledge, show to him the way of understanding. So the theme of Isaiah chapter 40, we know that it's talking about the deity of our God. And uh, we see in the scripture here that he is the only God in heaven and earth, and he has created all things. And God is emphasizing here that he makes his own choices. And no one is instructing him. No one's telling him what to do. He does what he wishes. He does what, uh, what pleases him. And so we must recognize that God has free will. 
And most importantly, he does all things perfectly. Amen? Okay. Without sin. Right? Okay? And so Psalm 118, and Psalm 18, go to Psalm 18. Psalm 18, let's go back to Psalm. Okay? Psalm 18, look at verse 30. Psalm 18, look at verse 30. It says here, as for God, his way is what? Perfect, right? His way is perfect. The word of the Lord is tried. He is a buckler to all those that trust in him. So as we have our lives, we don't do things perfectly like God does. Okay, God is perfect. Okay, we just established that just a moment ago. All right, and, uh, and he does everything right. He has his own free will. He has his own uh, pleasure, and he likes to do things whatever he decides to do. But for us, we're not perfect. We are sinners. And so that's why we need the Lord, <laughs> who does everything perfectly, okay? And uh, that's why we need his will. And everyone here in this room, as born-again believers, if you're a Christian, you know, there is a great desire to know God's will. Yeah, the inward man seeks for that. Okay? And, uh, and your conscience is bearing witness of that all the time. And even in prayer, we have this desire. When we pray to God, you know, sometimes we might pray for something, and then we decide during prayer, oh, that's not how I, I, I should be praying. I should be praying for God's will to be done. How many have that experience before, right? Okay. And you kind of want something, but God says, ah, uh, that's not how you should pray. Now, let's direct, let me direct you to another prayer and where I have my will, I have my direction for you. And you may not know it right now, but you're trusting in me uh, to fulfill my will for your life. So I'm sure many of you had that in prayer. And even Christ instructs us to pray this way. Go to Matthew chapter 6. Okay, Matthew chapter 6 in the New Testament, first book of the New Testament. Matthew chapter 6. Look at verse uh, 9 here. Verse 9, Matthew chapter 6, verse 9. Okay. Matthew 6, verse 9. It says here, After this manner, therefore pray ye, Our Father, which are in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Okay, God is perfect. God is holy. Verse 10. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth, as it is in heaven. So, you know, as we have prayer, we see that Christ also even instructs us to pray that his will will be done, not only in heaven, but also where? In earth, okay, for us. So we should have that same desire today, and we should be led to pray that way. But the grave mistake that we have is that we tend to think that we need to seek God's will all the time, okay, because it is hidden. Okay. God's will needs to be sought because God keeps it in the dark for you, okay, and he won't reveal it to you until you really seek him. Now, how many had that type of understanding before in your life? Okay, I did, okay. Now, I want to encourage you today that that is not the case all the time. We don't serve a mysterious God, okay? We don't serve a God who's not going to let you know what he wants for you. And it's very clear from the scripture that he's not the author of confusion, okay? And if he's an author, that means, you know, he has written some things, okay? And uh, he has uh, given something to us so that we may know what he's thinking, what his desire is. And uh, let's say I have a diary. What does my diaries expose? My thoughts, my desires, my feelings, okay? Maybe my hatred for something, all right? And uh, if you get my diary, which I don't have, okay? If you get my diary, you might find out more about me. Why? Because it is written, okay? I'm the author of that diary. So why are you saying all this? Well, I'm saying all this because God is not the author of confusion, and he has written something, and which is called the Bible, and he has revealed himself to us through his word, through the Bible. And uh, so we must recognize that not only does, does he uh, uh, wants us to know his will, but he also communicates his will. 
And uh, his will is not necessarily lost. And it's really uh, right before us. And it doesn't need to be found. And it's right here in the Word of God. And uh, I know there are some things that are general today. And, and you might be thinking, you know, I can't really see from the Scripture where I could relate. And some decisions making you have, to, you have to do today, it might be a little bit more neutral. It might be not about sin. It might be not about what we need to do and the instructions of the Lord. And it might be very general. We'll talk about that in a moment. But most of what God wants us to do in our lives is right here in the Bible. And we need to always go to the Bible to know what pleases him, what his desires for us, and even how to pray. I mean, we just talked about prayer and, and uh, how Jesus Christ instructs us to pray. Hey, thank God we know what he wants us to pray. Amen? Amen. And we're not just kind of wandering around in this space, you know, uh, 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 you know a continuum where like, we're just kind of wandering in dark matters. Like, I'm not sure what I should pray, and, and I don't know what kind of words are going to come out of my mouth. No, we, just, we know how God instructs us to pray, and we fall in that same pattern, and I believe God is pleased when we pray that way, God's people say. Amen? All right? So you must recognize that God communicates, and God knows what he wants from us, and it's really found in the Word of God. Go to your Bibles to John chapter 7 now. Look at John chapter 7. Look at verse 14. John chapter 7, verse 14. <clears throat> John chapter 7, verse 14. Okay? Verse 14 through 17. It says here, Now about the midst of the feast... Jesus went up into the temple and taught. And the Jews marveled, saying, How knoweth this man that is having never learned? Verse 16. Jesus answered them and said, My doctrine is not mine, but his that sent me. If any man will do his will, okay, God's will, he shall know of the what? Doctrine. Whether it be of God or whether I speak of myself. So, just in the application of verse 17, I know the interpretation might be uh, uh, different concerning the deity of Christ here and things like that. But in verse 17, he says, if any man would do his will, he shall know of the doctrine. So vice versa, if you know the doctrine of God, you know his will. Okay, So that's very clear. So knowing the doctrine of God would direct us to the will of God. Where is the doctrine of God? In the Bible. The Bible says in 2 Timothy 3.16, I'll quote for you, all scripture is given by inspiration of God, is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto how many good works? All good works. Okay, all good works. Okay. So any good works that God wants us to do, it could be fulfilled if we just go to the Bible. Right? Okay? So the scripture is inspired by God, it's profitable for doctrine. If you know the doctrine of God, then we will follow through what he wants us to do. And that will is very clear as long as we read the Bible. So how do we, how do, we do his will? By knowing the doctrine of God, the word of God, the teachings of the scripture. Now, when we see God's will, we must first look at the doctrine of God. And most of his will is already found here in the scripture. And before we get into the heart of the message, by way of introduction, let's establish three categories of God's will that is very clear and that we need not to be confused about. Okay? The first two is already given to us in doctrine, which is in the word of God. Okay? So the first two, we don't need to worry about it. It's already found in the scripture. If you have questions about these categories, just go to the Bible and you'll find it. Number one, the moral will of God. The moral will of God. As we have free will... We must understand we need to freely choose the spiritual and not the carnal, okay? And the moral will of God is to choose between what's holy and sinful, what is good and evil, what is right and wrong, what is righteous and wicked, okay? So, you know, now, do we serve a holy God, right? Be holy for I am holy, God says very clearly, right? So in the moral will of God, we don't have to kind of scratch our head in thinking, I wonder if God wants me to sin. You don't need to have that kind of question. Okay? You don't need to pray about whether you should sin. No, God doesn't want you to sin. Okay? So in the moral will of God, 
we see in the scripture that holiness needs to be sought and it can be found as long as you follow through what God wants you to do in his commandments and laws concerning righteous living, holy living. Okay, so God's will is holiness, goodness, and righteous. And this is very straightforward. And uh, for example, God doesn't want you to have worldly friends. God doesn't want you to marry somebody who's not saved. Why is that? Well, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, let's go there. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Look at verse 14. All right. Uh, Second Corinthians chapter, thank you, Brother Oliver, for this fan. One button shines my face with light. The other button does the fan. So I try to not to be Moses, turn on the light. But anyways, uh, but the fan's good. And the first Second Corinthians chapter 6, look at verse 14, all right? And then it says here, be not unequally yoked together with who? Unbelievers. For what fellowship with ha- righteousness with unrighteousness? righteousness. What communion hath light with darkness, and what conquered hath Christ with Belial? What part hath he that believed with the infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them, and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. You see, you know, the Bible is very clear that we need not to run with unbelievers. Amen. You know, after I got saved, you know, I, I hung around with my friends a little bit, but I soon found out that I found out that it didn't really, you know, I, I didn't really connect with them anymore. Okay. And what they're doing, what their desire was, it wasn't my desire anymore. So, you know, I stopped making phone calls. I stopped making, you know, uh, invitations and saying, hey, what should we do this weekend? I stopped doing that because it just didn't match up. And so what did I do? I just started to hang out with my church friends more who were saved. And they might not be the most perfect Christian, but at least they're saved. Amen. Amen. And, uh, you know, uh, so, uh, you know, God has directed me in that way. I didn't have to pray about that, actually. I didn't have to, dear God, should I hang around with John? I know he smokes and drinks, but should I go out with him? You know, I didn't pray about that because if I go out with John, I know he's going to be smoking. I know he's going to be drinking. I know he's going to be listening to worldly music in the car. He's going to go to some wrongful places and my desire is not there, I just knew I didn't have to pray about that because God doesn't want it. And that's what the Bible says. And God said it very clearly, be holy for I am holy. And so, you know, I need to go in the direction of righteousness. So this will concerning, you know, what's right and wrong and what's holy and what's sinful, it's very clear in the scripture. You don't need to pray about it. And you just need to say, Lord, I'm just going to trust you and have faith in you and your will has been revealed to me. And so uh, I think about it in Joshua 24. For the sake of time, I just quote for you. It, it says in, in 24, 15, If it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom you will serve, whether gods which your father served that are on the other side of the flood, or the gods of the Amorites with whom land ye dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. You know, when Joshua said that, the people responded immediately. No, we will serve the Lord. Yeah, they didn't have a meeting. Let me get back to you after five days. Pray about it. Okay. Okay. They didn't have to pray about it. You know why? Because they knew in their conscience and also by God's word, hey, we're supposed to cling to the word of God. We're supposed to, you know, live a holy life and make sure we have the right worship and, and go in the right direction. And uh, by the way, it's up to you, though. God's not going to force you to be holy. Okay. He's not going to, you know, tie you up and be holy now. Okay. He's not going to do that to you. It's up to you. If you want to follow in his will, about holiness. Okay. And, uh, and if you choose to do that, which is sinful, you will reap the consequences. Galatians 6, be not deceived, God is not mocked, for whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. For, that, uh, for uh, he that soweth to the flesh shall the flesh reap corruption, but he that soweth to the spirit shall the spirit reap life everlasting. Okay. And uh, this is the law of sowing and reaping in, in the spiritual sense. If you sow to the flesh, you will reap corruption, the Bible says. Okay? But in the spirit, you will reap everlasting. Okay? Choose what you're going to do. Okay? It's already laid out for you. So living a holy life uh, in the moral will of God, it's very clear. God wants you to be holy. 
God wants you to be righteous. Now, I'm not perfect, you're not perfect, and we're going to have to fight this flesh. We talked about that a couple of weeks ago, right? And, uh, but uh, I believe that we could still just uh, follow through what God wants us to do and have faith in it. We may not be perfect, but I believe that God will be pleased with that, and God will have us bear fruit, and we're going to have right, ch- right, uh, right child-rearing, right marriage in the right direction, and right, the right future for our lives. And uh, because we are seeking the holiness of the Lord. And so with that, uh, secondly, not only the moral will of God, but the mandated will of God. The mandated will of God. Now, this is more pertaining to serving the Lord and being led by his instruction. For example, does God want you to be a church? Okay? You don't need to pray about it. You don't have to pray on Sunday morning, dear God, should I go to church today? You don't need to pray about that. God wants you to go to church. You know why? Hebrews 10, 12. Go, go to your Bible too. Hebrews 10, 12. These are mandated will of God, okay? It's already mandated. It's already given to you an instruction. You need to do this, okay? And uh, Hebrews chapter 10, look at verse 25. Okay, Hebrews 10, verse 25. And not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, one another as so much the more as he see the day approaching. You see, God has already mandated it. He said, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. By the way, uh, you know, in the early church in the book of Acts, Acts chapter 2, the Bible says they met daily. I know you probably don't want to see me daily, okay? (laughs) But that's the standard of the early church there. They met every single day. And for the church door to be open on Sunday morning and Sunday afternoon, it's not that hard, okay, for you to come. And by the way, you don't need to pray about it. Amen? You don't need to pray about it. It's already been mandated. It's already been given to us. Commandments. Hey, here it is. This is what you need to do, okay? And uh, in Mark chapter 16, verse 15, and he said unto them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. We don't have to pray about so many you know, we don't have to pray whether today should I go today. <laughs> no, you should go. Okay, God's will is for you to go. I remember uh, uh, not only about sewing, but we had like a teen camp when I was back in the States. And uh, one of the teenagers who was about 17 years old, you know, being a senior in high school. And on Wednesday night, he was sitting in the crowd and, you know, they're asking for sign-ups for teen camp. And teens are going to camp to hear God's preaching and, and have some good fellowship among believers, you know. And the pastor was announcing it. And uh, Pastor Choi just kind of put him in the spot, this kid, and he said, I'm going to not give him the real name, uh, but James, James, are you going to go to camp? Did you sign up? And James said, Pastor, I'm praying about it. (laughs) And the pastor's immediate response was, you don't need to pray about it. (laughs) God wants you to go, okay, and sign up today. But anyways, you know, you know, there are some things you don't need to pray about. Okay? If it's godly, already spiritual, and you should be there, and God wants you to be there. Okay? And uh, so, you know, uh, the mandate of will of God, you don't need to pray about. I, I think about even the qualification of 1 Timothy chapter 3 for pastors. Okay? And, uh, you know, I should not be thinking, you know, uh, dear God, should I be a brawler? Okay. And no, I don't need to be. Why? Because I, don't, I, I shouldn't be. Why? Because the Bible already tells me not to be, not to be so. And uh, I need to be husband of one wife, okay? The Bible says I, I, I shouldn't be a, a divorced man as a pastor. And so it's, it's very clear in the scripture what's been mandated, the role of a husband. It's already been mandated, okay? And the role of a woman, it's already been mandated, okay? And, uh, for example, just in relationship uh, situation, for a man is to what? To love his wife, okay, as Christ loves the church and gave himself for it, Right? Okay, and then also the wife to be in submission okay, to her husband like the church is submitted to who? Christ. Okay? So these are some mandates that God has given us already. I mean, even for our kids, they shouldn't be praying about, dear God, should I honor my father and mother? Okay? <laughs> they don't need to pray about that. It's already there. It's God's will for them to honor their father and mother, even for me, for my mom back in the States. And so, you know, uh, uh, we could get a little sidetracked and try to, uh, uh, you know, I hate to use the word spiritualized, but some people are on cloud nine sometimes. They're just praying about everything, and they're praying about the mandate and also the moral will of God, 
where you don't need to pray about it because the Bible already tells you what to do. Okay? God is not the author of confusion okay? in the moral will of God and in the mandated will of God. Okay? And so with that, number three, okay, this is where we get a little lost. The miscellaneous will of God. The miscellaneous will of God. Now, this is where we get a little confused because sometimes God is not too specific in his word what we should do. And they're more general or neutral in his decision making. Like, for example, let's say, you know, uh, well, Oliver, okay, I'm not saying you will, but let's say you move back to Australia, okay? And you go to a certain town in Australia. There is two good Bible-believing churches there, good Baptist, sound preaching, salvation by grace through faith. King James only. Everything just lines up with what you believe in. Good, two, wonderful, Bible-believing church. And you have to make a decision. Which church should I go to? Okay? Now, I believe in this type of situation, God gives him free will. What suits him the best and for his wife to be? Maybe he likes one pastor's personality more than the other. Maybe one pastor is a little too dry, too kind of boring. The other pastor is more exciting, more fiery in his pulpit, okay? Their personality difference. And he might gravitate toward the other pastor, okay? Because it just suits him better. Okay? It just suits him better. And then also, you know, he's thinking about his family, you know, uh, how am I going to rear my kids under what kind of leadership or influence of the church? You know, what kind of church families are there? And, uh, you know, you're thinking about all that. And, and there are two good churches, but you have to choose one because you can't just be in two churches at one time, okay? So, you know, uh, 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 what church atmosphere, atmosphere best suits for your personality? And, and the list goes on, and, and you have to pray about it, yes. Uh, but you don't need to get an audible answer from the Lord where God says, Oliver, I want you to go to Mount Hill Baptist Church, Okay? He's not going to do that, okay? I believe he has some free will where, God, two good churches, but I think I like this one better. God says, okay, fine, because they're both alike. They have the sound doctrine. You know, they have the right Bible. They have, they have sewing program. Hey, just choose one, which one ever you like. Like, for example, like Adam, when he was created, right? And God told Adam, what did he tell him? He says, it's a tree of life. And the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And he says, you may freely eat any fruit, any of the tree in this garden, except for what? One. Okay? So the next day, after he gets that mandate, he goes to God and says, God, I really feel like an apple or a mango today. Which one is your will? <laughs> you think Adam did that to God? God, should I get an apple? Should I eat an apple? Should I eat a mango today? Which one do you want me to eat? Adam, I told you yesterday, you could eat whatever you want. You can't just eat that one tree, a tree of knowledge of good and evil. God says, eat whatever you want. So he, let's say Adam said, I feel like a mango. You know what? I'm going to have an apple at the same time. God says, great. I've given you free will. I've given you free choice. As long as you abide in the moral will of God and the mandate will of God, hey, you could do whatever you want within that, you know, uh, 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 category or in that uh, protection, okay? And uh, that's the same thing. As long as you abide by the moral will of God and the mandate will of God, okay, you could choose whom uh, you want to marry to, okay? Like I said, in the sense... As long as she's saved or he's saved, you know, that person, you know, is a faithful Christian, following the mandate will of God, you know, living a humble life, holy life. Hey, choose. Who do you want to marry? Okay. And, uh, and, and, and you can't marry two, amen, okay? You can only marry one, all right? And uh, there's no free will in that, okay? All right? And you can marry one. But I'm just simply saying... Uh, it's, it's, it's very clear in the scripture where God gives free choice and free will in this matter. And, uh, you know, uh, you know uh, thinking about uh, the mandate will of God, you know, sometimes, you know, uh, we, we, you don't trust the Lord and God gives you a little bit of 
grace. And I think about Gideon. Remember Gideon? God told him, hey, Gideon, you're going to you're gonna, you're gonna be delivering the people from the Midianites and things like that. What did Gideon do? He said, I'm going to lay a fleece out, right, okay, about the grass and the water and things like that and the dew. And why did he do that? Well, because he had lack of faith. But God was still gracious. He said, okay, let me, let me answer that prayer for you, and I'll give you confirmation. But did Gideon need to do that? He didn't need to do that. Would Gideon still have been successful without the fleece yes. miracle? Yeah, because God's word has already been given to him. Okay? So in the mandated will of God, you know, while uh, God might be patient with us, and you might be praying and saying, Lord, what should I do, and things like that, and God might be just giving you answer, uh, answer to prayer over and over again, and, uh, and you just need to make the decision to do it. And, uh, but there's some mis- miscellaneous will of God where you're abiding by the same mandate, you're abiding by the right mor- uh, morality, and you're just thinking, what should I do? Well, in that sense, I believe you have some free choices and free will. I really believe that. Okay? And uh, so uh, with that in mind, uh, I think about Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verse 10. And the uh, Bible says, Whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with thy might, for there is no work, nor device, nor knowledge, nor wisdom in the grave, whether thou goest. Okay? Like my son, Josiah, let's say he's good at math. God has given him wonderful gift in math. And that he has the choice to make in the future. He wants to be an engineer or maybe, uh, I don't know, uh, some kind of scientist, okay, tech scientist or something like that, all right? And maybe computer science engineer or maybe aerospace engineer, okay? Let's say those two things. Well, I have high hopes for you. But anyway, <laughs> maybe that's the two things, right? Let me, let me, let's say he has those two choices to make, okay? And, you know, sometimes he needs to pray about it, but whatever suits him best. Because both of those things, you know, is not going to affect the moral will of God or the mandate will of God. But, like, for example, like, if one of my ch- children um, wants to get a job, but it's going to affect his church attendance, it's affecting the mandate will of God, what do you do? You follow the mandate will of God. Okay, not your job, not the weekend pay or whatever. And so, you know, uh, you see where I'm getting at there? Okay, there's some freedom in the miscellaneous will of God. And you can make your free will and free choice. And within those, it might affect your mandate or moral. And uh, you always go with the mandate. You always go with, uh, with the right morality. And so uh, I hope this is very simple for you to understand concerning the miscell- miscellaneous will of God. Go to your Bibles to Romans chapter 14 as well. And, and, you know, Paul is talking about here eating meat or not eating meat. And uh, let me just give you free tr- free, um, a, f- a few scriptures where we could understand uh, that there is freedom, okay? And uh, it says here in verse 1, Romans 14, verse 1 in the New Testament. It says, Him that is weak in the faith receive ye, but not to doubtful disputations. For one believeth that he may eat all things. Another who is weak eateth herbs. Let not him that eateth despise him that eateth not. And let not him which eateth not judge him that eateth. For God hath received him. So God said, I mean, Paul says, hey, doesn't matter if you eat this or that. Doesn't matter. God has received both of you. And then uh, in verse 5, one man is deemed with one day above another, another is deemed with every day alike. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. And then he ends this chapter by saying, look at verse 23. And he that doubted is damned if he eat, because he eateth not of faith. Whatsoever is not of faith is sin. So in the middle of the context, and uh, I, I, I'm not, we, don't have, we don't have the time to get into it. But he says, hey, as long as eating meat doesn't offend your weaker brother to do something wrong, hey, you could freely eat the meat. But if it does, you should for, forbid yourself from eating meat because you're leading your weaker brother in astray, and uh, he's going into idol worship. Maybe he's going into you know, the temple and, uh, get, and, and, and eating the meat that's been sacrificed and taking it, you know, uh, personally in his life and, and, and just bowing to another god and things like that. And if you're leading your brothers that way, then you should just stop eat, eating, eating meat because it's affecting the moral will of God or made, maybe the mandate will of God. But in miscellaneous way, if it doesn't affect the brother, hey, just eat whatever you want. If you don't want to eat meat, don't eat meat. If you want to eat meat, eat meat. 
Okay? So, but he says, whatsoever is not of faith is sin. He does say at the end, make sure you do it by faith, though, that you do it for God. Okay? And so a a double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. Okay? So God does want you to make a choice in the miscellaneous will of God, and it has to be by faith. It has to be by faith. That's the important thing. Because whatsoever is not a faith, it is sin. Like, for example, that church situation with Brother Oliver, right? Let's say he goes back to Australia and, the, and, and those two churches praying about it. But, and, and he chooses one, but he, if he doesn't do it by faith, God's not going to bless it. Okay? And just like my son's situation with job and the career that he wants to do in the future, he's not going to bless it unless you have faith in it. Even concerning your spouse, your future spouse, You need to have faith that God will bless your marriage, that God will bless your relationship, that God will bless your chemistry, your, you know, uh, how you connect with each other. God's going to bless that. You've got to have faith in that. You have already established the moral will of God. You have already established the mandate will of God. And one thing you need to establish the miscellaneous will of God, though you have freedom, make sure you do it by faith. Okay? What sort of is not a faith? It is sin. Make sure you do it because God you know, because you have faith in God, knowing that God will bless it, okay? So with this in mind, I want to give you some help and more of a guidelines in the miscellaneous or various will of God that we need to have wisdom in. I'd like to share with you four realities that we need to consider and not ignore in uh, in this will of God. Number one, don't ignore the danger of covetousness and the contingent nature of your future. Uh, Go back to James chapter 4 and look at verse 14. Here's James talking about in general. Go to now, either say, today or tomorrow we will go into such a city and continue there a year and buy and sell and what? Get gain. Whereas you know not what should be on tomorrow, verse 14. So many times in our miscellaneous decisions, okay, we tend to make hasty and maybe even covetous decisions. Okay? And uh, we need to make sure our decisions are not based on what we are coveting after. And uh, remember the words of our Savior in Luke 12, verse 15. And he said unto them, Take heed and beware of covetousness, for a man's life consists not in the abundance of the things which he possesseth. And, uh, you know, also notice in the words of James here, buy and sell and get gain. Okay? So he's talking to those who are just really coveting after the riches of this world. Now, getting a job, buying and selling, there's nothing wrong with it. It's in the miscellaneous will of God. But if you attach covetousness with it, there's something wrong. There's something wrong. Working hard is good. Okay? Being a workaholic might be good for you as a man, but if you have covetousness with it, if you have a love of money with it, then you're going to end up with the wrong consequences and the wrong results. You get what I'm saying? And so, you know, it's like, for example, you know, uh, Think about these pastors who are rich in this world, okay? And there might even be pastors who are preaching the right gospel and things like that, but they're worth millions. What's the problem there? Nothing nothing wrong with doing ministry. Ministry is good. Helping people is good. Preaching is good. But what happened? They sought after covetousness. And uh, I, I, uh, I received the email about a couple of years ago, and, and I received this email from a Christian school and, and asking me if you have anybody in Japan who wants to study abroad as a high school student, let us know. And we will give you $400 a month for recommending student here from Japan to study abroad in our school. I said, why don't I just recommend it? You know? And uh, at the same time, why don't you just give him a discount, not me? <laughs> but that, that's like, it's like, there's something wrong with that. Okay? Christian school is good. Ministry is good. But somewhere along the line, money became the priority. And I'm not going to be duped by it. I didn't even respond to that. And then six months later, another email came with the same proposition. (laughs) And I realized, oh, this is not by mistake. 
They're seeking for something. Right? That's part of the business. They're trying to survive, maybe in ministry and things like that. They have a lot of bills to pay, but this is not the way to do it. If you're trying to get a boss student to pay more for your school than the regular students in the States, and you're trying to survive your ministry, and you're trying to back it up by saying, well, we'll lead them to Christ. I understand that. Why don't I lead them to Christ? I'm already here, okay? <laughs> and, uh, and, 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 you know, um, and I, you know I, I'm not God, all right? But when those things come about, I just know sometimes in my conscience it's wrong because it's not with humility, it's not with contentment, it's not by faith, but it's by covetousness. And not all churches are perfect, I understand, right? And, and from that time, two years ago, I haven't received the email since. Thank God maybe they dropped the ball on that and said, forget it. We're not going to do this anymore, okay? So I'll give them a benefit of the doubt. But I'm just simply saying it could be dangerous. So search your heart in the miscellaneous will of God. If there's covetousness involved, then you're going in the wrong direction, okay? And God's not going to bless it. And uh, we know that, but godliness with contentment is what great gain. That's the great gain. And for we brought nothing into this world, it is certain that we can carry nothing out. For having food and raiment, let us there be with content. By the way, by the way you know what I've, been, what I've been enjoying for the last you know, few weeks? is food. You know, I'm just happy with food. Okay? And uh, we, we figured out how to do shabu shabu at home. And we had it like four times already. And, uh, you know, it's hot, I know, but it's still good. Amen? All right? And uh, I went to Costco, and um, there was this called, something called naengmyeon, the Korean version of cold noodles. And they had it, and it was on sale. Nobody was buying it. They probably didn't know what it was. It was like $4 off. So I bought it, and my wife and I ate it the other night and said, oh, this is the real deal. This is really good, just like when we ate it back in California at the Korean restaurant. And uh, guess what? The next day, we ate it again. Amen? And, uh, but, you, know, you know, God says, having food and rain with us, we're with it. You know, it could be fun eating food. It could be fun just shopping for clothes here and there. And, uh, you know, uh, just having clothes and food that you could be contented about and be happy about. And that's in the will of God. That's in the will of God. For you to seek something more than that and gain and riches of this world, you'll never be happy. You know why? Because you're going to want more. You'll never be content. Just be content. That's the will of God for your life. And just live according to, uh, by faith, of course, and then secondly, with great contentment. So with that, um, James 14 also says, where is, we know not what shall be on tomorrow. You know, you know we don't know what's going to hold in the future. And uh, so, you know, it can't be just your own, you know, uh, uh, you know uh, I guess, uh, strategy or maybe your own plans. It might fall through if it's not by faith and also if it's by covetousness. And so uh, we think about, you know, uh, man, I try to practice this, uh, uh, this pronunciation. Jahazi? Jahazi. How do you do that? <laughs> it's, a little, it's a little hard. G-E-H-A-Z-I. I I've messed it up many times, and I looked it up this past week. I think it's... Uh, Gehazi. I think it's Gehazi. Okay, Gehazi. Okay, let's go with Gehazi tonight, okay, today. Gehazi, the Elijah servant. Remember that? Remember that? And uh, remember what he did? What did he do? Elijah said, no, 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 don't give me anything. Okay, just go worship God. And what does Gehazi do? He goes after Naaman and says, hey, the Lord wants, I mean, uh, my master wants something. And what happened? He didn't know what was going to you know, uh, what's going to happen to him in the future, but what was waiting for him? Leprosy. Not only for him, but also for his seed. Okay? Whereas you know now what should be on tomorrow. Remember Lot? He had the freedom of choice in the miscellaneous will of God. Hey, choose which plane you want to go. What does he pick? Sodom and Gomorrah. Direction towards Sodom and Gomorrah. And guess what happened? He started living in Sodom and Gomorrah. And his end was not what he expected. Whereas, you know, not what should be on tomorrow. What happened? Well, Lot had covetousness. Jehazi had covetousness. That's what happened. So don't try to plan and strategize in your own mind in covetousness. It's not going to work out. Okay? Make sure in this free will you're wise about this. You're content. 
and you're giving glory to God. Number, t- number two, don't ignore your concise life. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. You know, our life is like a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. Our life is too short to make too many foolish decisions and to make foolish decisions over and over again. Okay? And uh, go to your Bibles to Psalm 90. Psalm 90, verse 10. Psalm 90, here's uh, Moses. Psalm 90, verse 12. It says here, this day of our ears are three score years and ten, 70 years. And if by reason of strength, they be four score years, 80s, 80 years. Yet is the strength of labor and sorrow, for it is soon cut off and we fly away. Who knoweth the power of thine anger, even according to thy fear, so is thy wrath. So teach us to number our days, that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. Okay. And uh, it's kind of not fair, because Moses didn't live up, live up to be 80. <laughs> he lived up to be 120, I think. But anyways, but he says, you know, 70 and 80, okay, that's our life, really. And he says, it is soon cut off and fly away. And in verse 12, he says, so teach us to lumber our days, Lord, that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. So that should be our prayer. Lord, let me not make foolish decisions or hasty decisions in the miscellaneous will of God. And remember, our hearts are desperately wicked and deceitful. Let's not make foolish decisions by, you know, trusting our own heart. And let's say, let's keep on going to the scripture and making sure that we're under the moral will of God and the mandate will of God. And then also thinking about our lives. If I make this decision now in my lifetime, which is very short, how's it going to affect my marriage? How's it going to affect my, mar- uh, my children in the days to come for 20 or 30 or 40 years down the road? Okay. And so, yes, you might have a whole life ahead of you, okay, but it's still short. I'm still amazed I'm 40 this year. Okay. I feel like I'm 25, okay, but I'm 40 now. Okay. Next thing I know, I might be 70. Okay. I'm a little scared when, uh, Silas, you need to kind of sit up, okay? You're not sleeping. All right, good. And, uh, you know, if Ezra, Ezra is uh, one year, no, he's two years this year, two years, two years old this year. And when he becomes, you know, uh, 18, my goodness, I'll be uh, 66, okay? No, what am I? No, 56. I'll be 56, okay? And I'm just thinking along that line, am I going to really even see grandchildren from Ezra or, you know? So I've been praying, dear God. Help me to at least see my grandchildren before I die. But anyways, that's kind of my prayer, okay? But I'm not sure if it's going to happen, all right? But anyways, you know, I just know my life is short, okay? And I remember before I came out here to Japan, one of the mission directors, I was sitting in his office, and he said, how old are you right now? Well, I'm 37. And he said, well, about 15 years of good ministry. I said, oh, that's encouraging. <laughs> and, uh, anyways, and, uh, because he knows, and he's in his 60s, and he's thinking, you know, the prime of your life is like right now. And, uh, you know, a lot of ministries reach this height when they're 50, like 55 or something like that, he says. But anyway, I don't know if that's true. But I'm just simply saying life is very short. It, it is wise for you to make the right decision at the right time and not make foolish and hasty decisions. But just think about what's to come. Think about how it's going to affect you even next week or next month, okay? So be wise about that. Don't ignore the Lord's confirmation as well. Uh, for verse 15, for that ye ought to say, if the Lord will, we shall live and, and do this or that. You know, there'll be times when God will confirm with the green light or sometimes a red light, okay? Yes, even in the miscellaneous will of God. And uh, we, don't need, we don't have the time to go to it, but we know that Paul was forbidden to go to Asia, and also Bithynia, remember that? And the spirit suffered or not. It closed the door. Red light, you can't go there. Okay, God says, no, I don't want you to go there. Yes, you're preaching the gospel. You could, you're supposed to preach the gospel to every creature, but right now you can't go there. Okay, he closes the door. And then he opens another door to Macedonia. Okay, so he does intervene sometimes in our miscellaneous will of God. When we are doing good things and we are following the Lord, God will give you some red lights or green lights sometimes. So follow through that. And, uh, you know, uh, for example, let's say uh, somebody in here gets burdened about North Korea. Red light. Okay, it's closed, okay? And uh, I know you might want to do something and uh, for the people in North Korea, 
but it's closed right now. So go somewhere else and do something for God somewhere else. And, uh, you know, and you should be happy about that. You should be happy about the fact that, you know, God in every way has showed himself very clearly and say, that door is closed. Let me give you another opportunity to serve me. And you could still be used of God, God's people say. And you should be happy with that too. And I think about Paul talking about the open door. He says, uh, for a great door to effect you is open unto me. 2 Corinthians 2.12, for them, when I came to church as a priest of gospel, uh, a door was open unto me of the Lord. So, you know, God will open doors and close doors. So don't try to open it yourself, okay? Or don't try to close it yourself either. Sometimes some people try to close. Like some pastors might close the will of God for them concerning a church or ministry when God didn't really lead them to do that. So don't try to close it or open it. Just wait for the Lord's confirmation sometimes. And you have to pray about it. Lord, I know these both things are really good, but what do you want me to do? And he, and he will direct you and he will guide you with some prayers and answers. And I think about Japan and, you know, anything wrong with missions? Nothing wrong with missions. But for me to choose where to go, I, I kind of wanted to know, and I, I needed some confirmation. And, uh, and, and God gave me some answer to prayer. I'll not share it with you today, but God gave me some answer to prayer so that he will just lead me in the right direction. And I remember I used, I used to get burdened about, you know, Myanmar, Brother Agu. I got burdened about, you know, Cambodia, and I got burdened about, uh, you know, uh, Mongolia. And uh, thank God I'm not there, Amen. <laughs> <laughs> now that I look back, <laughs> thank God I'm in Japan. I got my udon and ramen and sushi. <laughs> anyway, I'm just kidding. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I, 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 I'm just saying, I'm just happy in the will of God. Amen? I'm just happy in the will of God. And, you know, some missionaries go to different places. I understand. And they should be happy, too. And they should be thanking God they're not in Japan. Whoa, silence in here. But anyway, so, I mean, they should be feeling like that. Why? Because it's God's will for their lives. Okay. And uh, so, you know, it's, it's, it's important to know uh, the Lord's confirmation sometimes, and God will answer those prayers, and he'll be patient with you. And then lastly, don't ignore your conscience. And verse 16, now ye rejoice in your boastings, all such rejoicing is evil. Therefore, to him that knoweth to do good, and doeth it not, to him it is sin. You know, uh, how boastful we are in our own flesh we will, right? And that's why he says, don't rejoice in your boastings, okay? And we know that we're in the wrong and God doesn't approve and we go ahead and do it anyways. And to him that knoweth to do good and doeth not, to him it is sin. Go to your Bibles to Acts 23 and verse 1. And we'll read a couple verses in Acts and then we'll finish here. Acts 23, verse 1. Here is Apostle Paul speaking here. And uh, it's pretty amazing what he says in his own testimony. Acts 23, verse 1. And Paul, earnestly beholding the council, said... Men and brethren, I have lived in all good conscience before God until this day. Wow, that's a great testimony. He says, I have lived in all good conscience before God until this day. He had a good conscience about him. And uh, he didn't do what God did not want him to do. And uh, he went along and do exactly what God wanted him to do. And I have lived in all good conscience. Go to Acts chapter 24, verse 16. And uh, here's another one here in 24, verse 16. He testifies again. He says, and here and do I exercise myself to have always a conscience for defense toward God and toward men. That's a good rule of uh, uh, That's a good rule for you and I to live by. You know, God has given us conscience. And make sure that you're not offending God and offending men. And always live according to what God wants you to do. And think about the people that will be affected by it, by your decisions too. Right? And my decisions I need to make will affect my marriage and my children. It's not your own decisions anymore. And so you have to think about that. Is it going to offend my wife? Is it going to offend my children? Is it going to offend my church if I make this decision? It's important. And uh, so to always have a conscience for defense toward God and toward men. Okay? Therefore, to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. Amen. 
now you're sinning against the Lord. If you're just ignoring the conscience, if you're ignoring what you should be doing, and having presumptuous sins, presumptuous will. And uh, so I want to encourage you. And in the miscell miscellaneous will of God, okay, number one, okay, make sure you recognize that uh, there is a, uh, the future that you need to think about and also the covetousness you need to think about. And then secondly, you need to think about the concise life. And then number three, the Lord's confirmation. And then number four, the conscience. All right, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for uh, this afternoon. And uh, thank you so much for your word, making it clear what you want from us. We don't need to kind of wonder. We have to just go to the Bible first, thinking about the moral will of God, the mandate will of God. And also even the miscellaneous will of God, you've covered some of it. And, uh, and, and also even a lot of it in certain, certain situations to know how to act and how to react in those uh, circumstances, Lord. And I pray that you give us wisdom, Lord, and uh, help us not to make foolish decisions, help us to be wise, and help us to be free. And um, knowing that you have done your will and having that conscience that's pure and right. Thank you for this group. Thank you for this church. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.